Pastor Charles D. Brooks presents the subject, The High Cost of Low Living, as recorded in the Breath of Life Crusade, Detroit, Michigan, March of 1990. The sermon will begin following the question and answer period. You will find that it makes coming to Jesus simple. Uh, the question man is here. You all willing to give him a hand, everybody? Now, I want to make a statement before he begins. We're getting more and more questions from you, and we like that. We appreciate it. You just write them out. Put one question on each card now, or piece of paper. If you have two questions, send in two pieces of paper. It helps us to judge the amount of time we can allot to this feature. But I want to say something else. Some questions that you send in are of such a delicate nature that I'm not sure I want to read it. I'm going to change the language of one. It was asking about self-abuse. Now, I don't want to be indelicate, so I'm saying it that way. And uh, that person wants to know, does the Bible endorse it? The answer is no. The grace of God is sufficient to keep us. Amen. And when the mind is turned toward the Lord, we're not ignoring that which nature has planted within us. We're simply denying self and allowing the Lord to control us until such time as we are wed. The Bible says the marriage bed is honorable. The suggestion is anything else is dishonorable. Amen. And the Bible condemns lust, which is a part of this business of self-abuse. The Bible says if you do that, you've committed adultery already in your heart. And so, dear one, the Lord can keep you. Oh, we know the Lord can keep you. Now, oh, there was another that I didn't know if I should read it all or not. And the reason is, it goes on to say that someone became a Christian, and both she and the husband were married, uh, I meant uh, baptized, that's what it is. Yes, they were both baptized, but the husband apparently, apparently was not converted. He continues to use drugs and abuse his wife, and then when she separated from him because of it, he went out to other women. This person wants to know, am I free? The answer is no. You're not free until you get a divorce. <laughs> You see, a divorce is the end of marriage. Now, I suppose the question you wanted to ask was, does that text, Matthew 19, cover me? It does if you are innocent and he is committing adultery. But the divorce should precede any further endeavors socially with men. Uh, that's about the best I can do with that. Next, now. All right. Evangelist Brooks, it states, I left my husband. Is it all right for me to see someone else? You know, when we preach on something, you get a lot of questions. I left my husband. Is it all right for me to see someone else? Of course it is. You may see Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> but that isn't what you meant, is it? You want to know if you can see Mr. Jones and uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Brown. Let me find a text for you. I think it's 1 Corinthians 7, I think. Hold on a second, I'll get there. Yeah, listen, Bible says, uh, and uh, uh, verse uh, 10, And unto the married I command. By the way, it's always good to write down these texts, because you don't want to guess, and you don't want, you don't want some unbelieving scientist telling you how to live if you're planning to go to heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, now listen, verse 10, 1 Corinthians 7. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. But whom? The Lord. The Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Now, that's the choice. There are some situations where separation occurs other than being caused by fornication. If I were a woman and my husband beat me, he'd only do it once. Hmm. I wouldn't stay with any man that beat me. Amen. That's right. 
Now, if you separate, you're not divorced and nor eligible for divorce. Perhaps that little separation will bring him to his senses, and that can be a meeting of the minds on common ground and new resolutions so that you can start off again. Now, I'm not telling you to separate. I told you what I wouldn't do. But you are not free at that point. And the Bible says it's best to stay with that husband if he's an unbeliever. But if you can, and you do separate those rare circumstances, remain unmarried. And if that becomes unbearable, the Bible says you must be reconciled to your husband, and reconciliation implies apology and repentance and forgiving and overcoming together. Would you say amen out there? Amen. And Paul said, this comes from the Lord. Next, please. I find the Bible hard to understand. How can I believe what I don't understand? Well, you've heard it all your life, I guess, if you've, if you've talked religion all your life. The Bible is God's Word, and we receive it by faith. What's that word? Faith. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we are creatures of faith. And every day you have to have faith. Amen. You walked into this auditorium by faith. How do you know that roof isn't going to fall down and kill you? And you sat in those chairs by faith. You believed that they were strong enough to hold you. You didn't even consider it. You just plopped right down by faith. Otherwise, the thing could give way and break your back. Isn't that right? Amen. You have a bill to pay and you put it in, put the check in an envelope, put a little stamp on there, and walk down to a very impersonal little red and blue box on the corner and drop that check in there, and you come home telling the wife, I have paid my bill. You haven't paid anything. You put a check in a box. By faith. Amen. Now, we need to quit kidding ourselves. Because of our limitations as finite beings, we have to live by faith. And who said you had to understand everything? You can't understand television, but you watch it. You can't understand radar, but the man will get you. You can't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and give white milk and yellow butter, but you receive it. We're creatures of faith. Now, God simply tells us to believe on Him, and He gives us ample evidence in the Word and in experience that we might develop faith. He gives us a measure of faith to begin with. And then faith grows as experience grows. Would you say amen, I think? Amen. And faith comes from the same Greek root as no. Faith has in it the germ of action. When you really believe, you know. And when you really know, you do. For faith without works is what? Yeah. And so, ladies and gentlemen, how do you accept and believe? You do it by faith. Try the Lord. And look at the experiences of those who have tried Him. And you will find that God doesn't leave us twirling in the wind on a string. He gives us ample evidence. And then one of the great things is to have God answer a prayer just for you. Amen. When that happens, you tend not to doubt anymore. Next, please, sir. Dear Pastor Brooks, I write and love music. What is considered to be Christian music, and what does the Bible say about it? I'm not a musician, but I certainly can give you some broad principles. Whatever a Christian does should be done to the glory of God. Would you say amen out there? And if you're writing music to the glory of God, I think that great principle will govern the way you write music. It should be edifying. It should appeal to man's higher instincts and not his lower instincts. Would you say amen? It should lift your spirit and men's spirits heavenward. It should cause people to want to live better lives and to walk with Jesus. There's a lot of music, incidentally, that is done even in religious services today that I'm not really sure accomplishes those purposes. And so, if you're really sincere and you want to write music, 
Let it grow out of your experience and out of your love for the Lord. And if you'll do that, then your music will help me. Next, please. Dearly beloved, I would like to know how to handle the situation of an argumentative saint who you can't talk to, <laughs> one who seems to love contention, which I hate, and strife. I try talking to the young lady, also praying others have also talked to the individual. The saint has not changed. Well, how do you handle someone like that? One of the answers might be to stay away from her. <laughs> if she's unresponsive to good counsel and prayer, then perhaps that person is not attractive to you. Love that person as a child of God, but you don't have to like her. Now, if that baffled you a little, I intended it to. You know, there's some people I love, but I don't like. The Bible doesn't tell me I have to like everybody, but I have to love you. Amen. I have to value you as a person. I have to be willing to do anything that needs to be done to assist you and to help you. I have to be willing to pray for you. But I don't have to like you. Hmm. Now, I'm not trying to be facetious. To like someone means that you generally find them attractive and you enjoy being around them. And uh, everybody doesn't fit the bill for everybody else, isn't that right? Amen. So if this person is incorrigible, perhaps you should just stay away from that person and just be kind and friendly at long distance. Hmm. Now, on the other hand, you said you've prayed and you've talked and you've counseled. You, maybe you need to let it wait a while. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Is the Old Testament important for Christians? I thought it was fulfilled and passed away. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16. You ought to write that one down. That's a good one. 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says all. What's that first word? All. How much? All. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it's helpful and good and beneficial and uplifting. Now let's go again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And then it gives a, a list of things that it is helpful in. For correction, reproof, instruction, all Scripture. I would like to tell you something that perhaps you hadn't thought about when you wrote that question. When Jesus was here, there was no New Testament. Did you know that? Amen. There was no such thing. Now, we who study these things look for all kinds of information, and I learned a long time ago that probably the first book of the New Testament recorded was the book of Mark, and it was probably written about 23 years after Christ had died and gone back to heaven. So for about 20 years, the New Testament church didn't have a New Testament. Hmm. That's important to consider, isn't it? Amen. When Jesus said in John 5, 39. 39. When Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. That's right. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the Old Testament, because that's all there was. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said the Old Testament testified of me. That's verse 39. Read verse 46. It said, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Mm -hmm. Now that's very clear, Amen. isn't it, everybody? Amen. I heard an old preacher say, before I ever got married and started in the ministry, he said, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, hmm. and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Amen. Don't ever forget that. Amen. Next, please. Our last question for tonight. Is it true if you sleep with a Bible under your pillow, you will get a real blessing every day? You might get a crick in your neck. There's a very familiar text in Psalm 119 and verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my... You even know the text, don't you? Thy word... Let me quote it again and you, you, you listen and see if I do it correctly. Thy word have I hid under my pillow. Doesn't say that, does it? All right, let's say it correctly. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
So you better get that Bible from under your pillow and get it in your head, in your heart. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. We'll continue to answer them. You send them in. Very much, Breath of Life Quartet. The title tonight, The High Cost of Low Living, suggests something rather profound in itself. The High Cost of Low Living. If I were going to use a text tonight, it would be Galatians and the sixth chapter and verse seven. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Saints, do you know, if we ever learn to just take God at his word, we're going to be better off, aren't we? No need equivocating when God speaks. No need trying to figure out a loophole. When God speaks clearly and explicitly, he means what he says. And the Bible says, be not deceived. Don't let anyone fool you, and don't fool yourselves. God is not mocked. Whatsoever. And you remember, I told you how when you read God's word, you ought to pay attention to every word. Whatsoever is an important word. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now I have heard and seen some of the apparent contradictions in God's word. By the way, God's word is a unit. One God gave his word. Don't expect it to argue with itself. Don't expect a dichotomy between the Old and the New Testaments. There is harmony in God's Word. If you believe it, say amen. amen. And yet I've heard people want to argue with a certain scripture or a certain fact of scripture, and they will bring up another to prove a point. Maybe this would be a good time to define the word amen, because I ask you to say it now and then. I don't really ask you to say it because I need you to help me preach. There was a time when God said to Moses, let all the people say amen. Now the word amen is what we call a transliteration. It's said the same way in all languages. Maybe a different accent. I have been to countries where they say Amin, but it's the same word, and I've heard it other ways. A transliteration, and it means variously, it means truth, <coughs> Lord, <Yes>. truth, Lord. <coughs> Please. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Strange. <laughs> Dude, tell the truth. <clears throat> I don't like to explain this, but it's coming up in my sermon tonight, so I'll tell you now. I suffer with sinus. Itis. And it affects here. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> now, amen means truth, Lord. So when I ask you to say amen after hearing a spiritual fact, it is your way of participating, even as Israel did, and acknowledging that you understand truth. If you've got that, say amen. amen. Another thing it means is, verily, verily. Jesus often used that term, verily, verily. It means truth, truth, certainly, certainly. But one of my favorite definitions is, one of my favorite definitions is, I accept 
I will not argue with Jesus. Now that's a good one, isn't it? So if you say amen after hearing a truth, it means I accept it. Now you don't need to accept what I say. You don't need to accept what some denomination says. But it is wise always to accept what Jesus says. Now say amen. amen. I will not argue with God. Now, with your kindness, I'm ready to begin my sermon again. The high cost of low living. God said, whatever a man soweth, he will reap. Thank you, Pastor. I believe that. Do you believe that? Thank you. It's there. Thank you so much. Whatever a man soweth, he will reap. And then there are those who suggest an apparent contradiction. And one of those that I hear is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, you know that chapter. It's the one that says there's a time for this and a time for that. And the Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which was planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. In that chapter, a whole litany of things that God says there's a time for. And I have had people say to me, since there's a time for all this, must mean it's all right. And there is a conflict in their minds. A wise Bible student doesn't stop with an incomplete idea or one that is an apparent contradiction. A wise Bible student, thank you so much, will look for the information that will bring the harmony that is always there. And if we do not find it, the mistake is with us and not with God. Let me then read on a little further. That's Ecclesiastes 3. I am now going to chapter 11 and verse 9. There the Bible says, Rejoice, O young man. Let thine heart cheer thee. The suggestion is, do whatever you want to do. Have a good time. But then the verse ends, but God will bring thee into judgment. Huh? In verse 6 of chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, To every purpose there is time and judgment. We may do as we please, but there is a price to pay. And if we practice low living, there is a high price to pay. And God has said it succinctly in his word, to every purpose, there is time and judgment. Many today are playing games with their souls. The stakes are too high. Yeah. There are many who say to me, Pastor, I'm sowing a few wild oats now, but one of these days I'm going to straighten up. Don't worry about me. Have you ever heard that? There isn't a one of us tonight who knows that he will be alive tomorrow morning. Playing games. But here is perhaps the more dangerous thought. Even if you don't die, even if you live another 50 years, it is still not wise to go against the Word of God because when one does that deliberately, he is destroying his own character 
putting, as it were, a callus upon his own soul, decimating his own spirituality. Now, I have a son, and he's a grown man, but when he was growing up, I did what all you fathers do. I counseled with my son, and we were great friends and all. And I remember telling him once, son, it doesn't matter whether I find out or not. Doesn't matter whether your mother finds out or not, or anyone else. Nobody gets away with anything. And if you practice doing wrong when you know that it's wrong, you are destroying your own character and conscience. You are paying even if we never find out. It's important for us to understand that. Or else we will play games with the devil. When our motivation is to do whatever feels good, we are playing a dangerous game with the devil. And there's a high cost to low living. And many today, even in our communities and sometimes in our families, many today are paying that debt with broken homes, broken health, and broken hearts. Would you say amen out there? Ladies and gentlemen, I visit these people. I pray with them. And God is good. He will forgive. But the price is still there to pay. Important for us to understand that. Even when you repent, if you have sown wild oats, even after you repent, that seed will generally spring up. And if you sow wild oats, you're going to reap wild oats. If you sow tares, you're going to reap tares. You're not going to sow wild oats and reap barley. As you sow, so shall ye reap. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, every one of us deserves to die. The wages of sin is death. But glory to God, the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that Son so loved the world that he came down here and resolutely turned his face toward Calvary, and he never turned back until he died our death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus has paid. And all who will believe on him may have that payment instead of their own. But even if the wages are paid, there are often what we call the consequences. Would you say amen? amen? And I can only tell you what the Bible says in Psalm 103 and verse 10. It says, He hath not dealt with us after our iniquities, nor rewarded us according to our sins. Even the consequences are tempered by a loving God. He bears a part of the load with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's because of his goodness. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15 and verse 4, God said, I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh. Yeah. Now, what is this all about? God had a king in Israel whose name was Manasseh. What was his name? And this man, the Bible says, turned holy away from the Lord. He was the king, he was the leader amongst God's people. And he led the entire nation into idolatry. He led the entire nation into sin and immorality. There was no dirt to which he did not give hospitality. And because the king was doing it, and it seemed right to do, the rest of the people just followed his example until finally they brought down the judgment of God 
payday someday. And God said through prophecy, I'm going to take Israel and scatter them into all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh. Now that is startling. God seems to be saying that this one's, one man's sin has demoralized the whole nation. This one man's sin has, through example, led children astray. This one man's sin, through endorsing disobedience, has led the church astray. And God says, I am now about to settle the issue. I have placed the matter on the scales in heaven, and they are balanced in favor of judgment, and I'm going to scatter Israel into all the world. It is true even today. Now, I can go places and I have gone where you don't see any black folks at all. And I've gone places where you don't see any German folks at all. And I've gone places where you don't see any Spanish folk at all. But I hardly go anywhere that I don't see Jews. They were scattered and they remain scattered. And in the beginning it was an act of judgment and God said, I'm doing it because of Manasseh. Now if you read uh, 2 Kings 21 and 2 Chronicles 33, you will discover that one day judgment came to Manasseh. Yes. And he was captured and carried away as a prisoner to a foreign jail. His eyes were put out. And in his blindness and in his suffering, he came to himself. It is so unfortunate that we are like that. Some of us never look up until we're flat on our backs. Some of us never kneel down until the load is heavy on our shoulders. Some of us don't even pray until we're in trouble. Well, Manasseh got in trouble. And he pleaded with God for forgiveness. And the Bible says God did forgive him and he was eventually set free. But ladies and gentlemen, his debt still had to be paid. The Jews are still scattered throughout all the kingdoms of the earth. Yes, sir. And Russia and some other countries wouldn't even let them go home in 1989. It is the judgment of God. There is a debt to pay. Let's think of a man whom God said, uh, who God said was a man after his own heart. And that man was David. Now everybody admires King David. If you go over to Israel, even now, the tourist guides want to take you, or the tour guides want to take you by what they call the tomb of David. Even now, he is highly respected. Bethlehem is called the city of David. There is the ruins of the Tower of David. David is one of the illustrious names from Jewish history. God said, David is a man after mine own heart. But one day this man, the sweet singer, one day this man of great integrity, one day this man of unblemished character, one day this man of impeccable righteousness was up on the rooftop and looking around and suddenly there was revealed before him what we might call an X-rated show. Bathsheba was taking a bath. And I don't know why anybody would take a bath on a rooftop over there unless she wanted to be seen. And David was tempted. And he found out she was married. And David said, where is her husband? He was on the battlefield. David sent for him and sent him again into the heart of the battle knowing that he would be killed. And after he died, David took Bathsheba as his wife. Now here's a man whom God ordered, anointed, a man that God said was after his own heart, but he fell. And you might say, well, how in the world could David be considered a child of God? Well, I'm happy to tell you that God is a, a wonderful God. And his grace is amazing. Yeah. And in Psalm 51, we have one of the greatest confessions ever recorded in Scripture. David said, O oh God, have mercy upon me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. 
blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity, and forgive me of my sins. David named three things. Trespasses, iniquity, and sin. I don't know if you've ever defined these in your mind or not, but there is a slight difference according to the scholars. A trespass is a weakness that one has over which he has not gained control. And the men in defining it use the figure of a fellow shooting a bow and arrow. And the idea is if you don't have the strength or the skill to hit the target, then that is trespass. But if you have the skill and, and, and you, you're able to reach the target, but you miss the mark, that's sin. But if you have the knowledge and the skill and the strength, and you deliberately miss the target, that's iniquity. Yep. A difference. Many of us make mistakes that are trespasses. Yes. Many others make mistakes just coming up short. And I know that's happened to you because it's happened to me. But when you know God's will and you are able to do it and you deliberately think it through and you deliberately fail, that's iniquity. Iniquity is sinning against night, against light. Iniquity is sinning against knowledge. Iniquity is sinning when you know better. And David knew better. So when he said, Lord, forgive me, he covered everything, trespasses, sins, and iniquity. And you know what? God forgave him. But there was a high price to pay. He had destroyed another man's home. And now his own home would be destroyed. His daughter was raped. His son Absalom rose up in rebellion against him and tried to take his life. One after another, his own family was torn apart, ladies and gentlemen. And one day, David, in humiliation, even after he had tried to get it right with God, was going along, running for his life. And a man stood on the hill and threw stones at him and cursed him. David had to pay the consequences. David realized there is a high cost to low living. The man came to the point of almost discouragement. I can just imagine him now. He looks at himself and he's ashamed. He looks out for those former friends. You know folk will stick with you as long as everything's going all right. But when your life gets in a mess, often your best friends will turn against you. Isn't that right? He looked at himself and he was a mess. He looked out at his friends and they had turned against him. I guess David decided it does no good to look at myself. I'll be discouraged. It does no good to look out there. No man will help me. Well, David, what are you going to do? He said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. If I'm going to be helped at all, I better stop looking at self and looking at others. I better look unto Jesus. Now, that's what happened to David. The thief on the cross repented. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. How many of you believe he's going to be in the kingdom? Say amen. amen. Therefore, you believe he was forgiven, don't you? Amen. But he didn't come off that cross. He's going to be saved, but he still was up there. There's a high cost to low living. Would you say amen out there? Amen. I was running a meeting in Cleveland, Ohio, a long time ago. And I baptized a man about 85 years of age. And one morning I went into church very early, and that man was sitting in there by himself. Nobody else had come yet. And I heard somebody crying, and I turned and looked, and he was just sobbing. I walked over to where he was, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, My brother, please, let me share your burden. What is it? What's wrong? And he was embarrassed at his tears. He looked at me and said, Pastor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He said, I was just sitting here thinking how good the Lord is and how I wish I'd given my life to him sooner. He said, if I had given my life to him sooner, my daughter would not be a streetwalker and my son would not be in jail. There is a high cost. To low living. Man went out and jumped in his car, half drunk, went speeding down the highway, was involved in a terrible wreck. And he recovered and became a Christian, but he lost his leg. And when he asked God to forgive him, God forgives, but he didn't grow another leg. 
There is a high cost to low living. Now, I stood up here before you tonight embarrassed. It only happens occasionally. But I know what the problem is, and the reason I'm embarrassed is not so much that I couldn't say anything for a moment. The reason I'm embarrassed is because of what I'm about to tell you. When I was a little boy, we had a swimming hole down through the woods. And it was one of the delights of summer to join the gang in the swimming pool. Swimming hole. And one evening after sunset, about six or seven of these fellows came up to my house and they said, Charles, we're going swimming. Come go with us. And I went tearing into the house and I had a mother that was a saint if ever one was born again. And, I, and perceptive, you know how these women are with their intuition. And she said, son, where are you going? I said, mom, I want to go swimming with you. She said, please, no, don't do that tonight. I said, what do you mean? She said, don't go swimming tonight. I said, why? She said, it's the, it's the weather. The exposure will make you sick. It was summertime. Didn't make sense to me. But she gave me an order. And I said, yes, ma'am. Now, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. And to violate that is a sin. Don't you believe that? I said, well, Mama, I'll just go down there with him and watch. Let me give you young people some good advice. If you don't plan to go swimming, stay away from the swimming hole. You got no business in a parked car unless you plan to do business. You got no business going to a bar unless you go drink. I went on down there with them, you know, and every one of them jumped in the water and was having a time. Moon came out, and I'm sitting there reasoning. Makes no sense. Here you got a nice soft breeze blowing, and you got a moon out furnishing light, and all of my friends are out there having a time, and I'm sitting on the bank watching, and every now and then one would dive under, and he'd come up right in front of me, and he'd say, Charles, it's wonderful out here. Oh, come on in. That's the way the devil gets us into trouble, you know. He always wants you to think it's wonderful. The devil will talk up a blue streak until he gets you into trouble. And then when you need somebody to help you explain it to mama, he'll stand back and leave you on your own. So here I was sitting on the bank, and they're wearing me down, ladies and gentlemen. I begin to reason in my mind that I can do this and get away with it. And finally, they said it one time too many. And I said, I'm coming in. And I stripped the unit in the heel, swimming suit in those days. I pulled off everything. And I got a running start. And right into the middle of it I was. And when I began to enjoy it, Mother's counsel seemed more ridiculous than ever. And when the time came to get out, I didn't have a towel. So I went out and laid in the grass and let the wind dry me. Went on home, and the next morning I woke up with a burning sensation that went all the way up to here, like I had to sneeze real badly and couldn't, and that was more than 45 years ago, and it's still bothering me, and what you saw tonight is the result of it. Now look at here, I love my mother, and we got it together, and I apologize, and I asked the Lord to forgive me. Do y'all believe he forgave me? I still got sinus trouble. There's a high cost for no living. Would you say amen out there? While the wages of sin are endured by our Savior, the consequences of sin are often left with us. It does not pay. And then we must not think for a moment that God will not bring us into judgment. The Bible tells me that everybody is going to have to stand in the judgment. Now, we say that, and we we hear it preached, but I don't think we think it through. How austere will this judgment be? I just want to give you some suggestions. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, the Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Now, you know God is infinite, and we can't explain Him the way you explain a person. The eyes of the Lord everywhere. I never will forget hearing somebody talk about this one day, and he talked about private eyes. You know what those are. 
Those are detectives. Well, suppose it does mean that. He's got multiplied millions of angels, and they are everywhere. But I'm not limiting God. With his wisdom and with his power and with his might, he is able to discern and to watch us. Nothing is hidden from his terrible gaze. There's an old spiritual that says, my Lord is writing all the time. He hears all you say. He sees all you do. My Lord is writing all the time. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, the Bible says, The hairs on your head are numbered. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. There isn't anybody in here tonight who knows exactly how many hairs are on his head unless he has none. But God knows that much about you. You don't even know that much about yourself. But wait a minute, you missed something, and I'm not going to let you miss it. The text does not say the hairs on your head are counted. It says the hairs on your head are numbered. And I see a difference. It seems like God has assigned a number to every strand. And when you get older and start losing it, every time a hair falls out, he knows which he knows which one fell out? Because the hairs on your head are numbered. Hair number one and number two and number three, all the way up to hair number 95,000, according to Reader's Digest, the average amount of hairs on the average head. God says, I've numbered it. Now, God who knows me like that, I can't fool. Some people are too tired to pray. Those same people will go to the dance hall and two-step all over the floor. Every time you lift your foot and put it down, God knows how many steps you take. You think that's tight? Listen to this one. Job 13 and verse 27. He said, Thou settest the prince of my heels. Ladies and gentlemen, that sounds like the FBI taking footprints. When I was pastoring in Columbus, Ohio, I went to the university to get some dental work done. And my dentist was a fine young man in his senior year, and the whole group, and we kind of got to know each other. And there was one of them whose wife was expecting a newborn baby at any time. And all of those fellas were just excited. And they were waiting for the phone to ring. This young man was up there one day working uh, in his dental cubicle, and the phone rang. And somebody answered it, and they called him, Hey, it's for you! And he came running over, and all the fellows who could left their cubicles and came over to hear the good news. His wife was being watched by her father and would be taken to the hospital to have a baby. And when he picked up that phone, joy turned to terror. They saw the expression on his face. He began screaming, No, no, no! And he dropped the phone. And somebody else picked it up. The father was on the line. The young man's wife had just been shot right between the eyes. Murdered and raped in the ninth month of pregnancy. Never a more horrible crime. That night on the news, everybody was keyed and looking. And on the news that night, they talked about it. It was in a wealthy neighborhood. And across the street, a woman lived with her son, about 20 years old. And that son came over across the street and began to ask the policeman, Can I help? Anything I can do? And they were baffled until an old professional was snooping around looking for clues when suddenly under a window a footprint. They called in the people from the laboratory. They made a cast of that thing. And in the Columbus Dispatch newspaper the next day, they printed a rather accurate description of the criminal. They knew he was young because this kind of shoe was generally favored by young men. They knew he per apparently came from a well-to-do home because they ascertained it was an expensive shoe. They knew his height and weight because of the depth the footprint had sunk into the mud. And in that description, they were describing a neighbor. The same young man who had come asking, is there anything I can do? And within hours, he confessed. He showed them where the gun was. He had tied a string around it and let it down between the ceiling and the wall of his home. And he pulled it up, and they had him.
and they got him with a footprint. The Bible says, thou settest the prince of my heels. You can tell your wife you didn't go by her house. But God says, I got your footprint. Not that he needs the evidence, but he needs to impress us that nobody gets away with anything. And for every act, there is both time and judgment. Oh, I've got something good to tell you, but right now let's go to the screen. Let's uh, get the curtains up and the camera on as we conclude our remarks this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, God is a good God, and He's long-suffering. There's a text that says, because judgment against an evil work, because judgment against sin is not uh, executed speedily. If God knocks you down every time you did wrong, you straighten up. But because God is patient and because God is kind and because he doesn't slap you down every time you do wrong, we get into the notion that we can get away with it. We become presumptuous. But it does not work. Ladies and gentlemen, every day we are faced with choices that have to be made. Did you hear me? We come to the fork in the road. One way is the way of obedience. The other way is the way of rebellion. And we stand there needing to make a decision. Ladies and gentlemen, it is up to us. Let's go on to the next one then. We cannot go even according to how it seems to us. Here is the text you ought to memorize. Proverbs 16, 25, Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a way which seemeth how. You know how many times people have put aside God's Word because of their opinions? God speaks and you see it, but I don't agree with that. The way I see it, a man arrogating himself up against God. Who do we think we are? There is a way that seemeth right. It'll make sense to you. But the Bible says it is the way of death. God speaks and we don't want to listen. We stop our ears and turn our backs and we make our way into darkness rather than walking in the light. That's the way human nature is. You can't go by feelings. And religion that is sheer emotionalism, I started to say emotions, I meant to say emotionalism. I believe in emotions. And I believe in enjoying my religion. I don't believe in rolling on the floor. I, I've never done that and don't ever intend to. But I enjoy my religion. When I was a student, they taught me in homiletics to appeal first to the intellect and then to the emotions and through them both to the will. Is that all right? So let's not condemn emotions. But emotionalism, which means it is the essence, the sum total of our religion, that is worthless because feelings change. But God does not. Truth does not. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to find out what truth is. And the Bible says, Thy word is truth. And if we discover the truth, we got to make up our minds to stand with it. And when we do that, we're walking in the light. If we don't do that, we're walking in darkness. Some of us are too busy with everything else. We are proud and arrogant. We're so proud, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We've got our friends and our guest list is made up of the big shots. And some of us are embarrassed to obey God because of our friends. You can do what you want, or you're a free agent, but there's payday someday. We do not get away with it. I just happen to throw these in. Do you know what? There's an actual decline in smoking on the part of men, but an increase on the part of women. Now, a cigarette contains 22 poisons, including formaldehyde. Did you hear what I said? And cyanide. When they put you in the gas chamber, they use cyanide capsules. There is a trace of cyanide in every cigarette. And how sad it is for me to know 
that women are smoking more than ever while men are trying to quit. And for some reason, they are convinced that it is chick and cute. Ladies and gentlemen, take it from a man, it is not. When I think of a lady, I think of daintiness and the good smell of cologne or good soap. When I think of a lady, I think of freshness and beauty. That's what I think of when I think of my wife. Not that. Now, you can do that if you want to, but you got to pay. They say every cigarette takes nine minutes off your lifespan. And how many are dying of cancer? We talk about drugs, and it is a terrible problem. The other day, John Chancellor said on NBC, I think it's NBC, John Chancellor said the other night, only 2,000 people died from drug overdose last year, but 390,000 died from cigarette smoking. Payday! And we go from one thing to another. They take pictures of nice-looking people with a glass of liquor, and they put those pictures in your magazine, and they want you to think that if you get drunk, you're going to look like that. Now, this is called Motor City, and when Cadillac wants to advertise their cars, they take the finished product, and they put a picture of it in the newspaper, isn't that right? And you look at the picture and it appeals to you. Ford does the same thing. Chrysler does the same thing. But the liquor business is one industry that does not put its finished product on display. These models sometimes don't even drink. They get fresh-faced young people. They don't show the red eyes and the missing teeth and the unkempt, unshaven faces. They don't show what a bum looker can make of you. They don't go get that wife who's had a fist planted in her delicate bosom. They don't get those little children who didn't get enough to eat because daddy wasted his money on their product. But nobody gets away with anything. And after that, drugs. God help those, please, that are afflicted. But ladies and gentlemen, for the life of me, I can't understand why anybody would try it today for the first time. And somehow Satan convinces them that it's wonderful until they're hooked and they hate life. The high cost of low living, of turning away from light to walk in darkness, there is a price to pay. But on the other hand, those who acknowledge the Lord and His Word, those who are willing to accept Jesus as their Savior, those who understand they're in a lost condition and need a Savior, who never boast of their goodness, but plead only to be covered with the righteousness of Jesus. Those experience a peace that passeth understanding. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to start enjoying your pay. You start now. Better health, happier homes, clearer consciences, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. When you accept Christ, the pain starts here. The Bible says, whoever hath the Son hath life. And you don't have to wait until hereafter. You begin to live now. So I make bold to make my recommendations when you kneel and meditate and pray and study, 
Life is better now. Happiness comes home now. I have studied the experience of man. I have seen the contrasts. I have watched the lives of those who rebel. I have seen the tears uh, of the broken-hearted wife. I have felt the tension in the atmosphere. No laughter, no music in the home. I have seen it. And I made up my mind, it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. His way is the best way now. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It is the word of God. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after that, what? Judgment. I read it to you from Ecclesiastes. For every purpose, there is time in judgment. If we didn't have to meet God by and by, it would be all right, perhaps. But one day, whether we like it or not, we got to meet God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad not only that but oh I keep having slides stick I'm sorry let's get past it to the next one alright we'll try it again there it is the wise man in that book Ecclesiastes we quoted from he said sure there's a time for everything under the sun but in the first two chapters he also said I've tried everything that's done under the sun you ever read that? Solomon said, I tried wine, and it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, I hoarded money and gold and silver, but it didn't make me happy. Then he said, I tried music. I got me men singers and women singers and instrumentalists. He had the bands come in and play, but somehow when he got in the bed at night, he couldn't sleep. And then he said, I tried mirth. He brought in comedians, and he said, tell me some jokes, and he laughed. And sometimes laughter sounds like insanity. He said, laughter is mad. It didn't work. And after that, he said, I tried food. And if you go over to First Kings, uh, uh, yes, First Kings, it will tell you how much food he needed for one day. And when I read it, I wondered, why on earth would any king need all of those provisions for one day? And then I read, he tried women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's a thousand hungry women. And when I read it, I said, no wonder he needed so much food. <laughs> but when he got through saying it, Solomon said, it's all vanity, vexation of spirit. There's no profit in it. Well, now, wait a minute, Solomon. If you're the wisest man that ever lived, is this your conclusion? After sampling all the things we want to try, he said, that's it. There is no pleasure, no profit. Well, then, would you give us some good advice? He said, I will, in the last chapter of the book and verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Therefore, he said, hear the conclusion of the whole man. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ladies and gentlemen, a man who tried it all said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole man. No need sampling all of this stuff, it doesn't work. No need trying something that has already proved a failure. You cannot buy happiness with money, or with wine, or with mirth, or with music, or any other kind of thing. Then what shall we do? Let us sum it all up and hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? Because God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And the Bible says, every one of us has got to stand in the judgment. I don't care how good a Christian mother was, she can't take your place. I don't care how good a Christian daddy was, he can't take your place. As the old spiritual says, you got to stand there for yourself.
And when God calls you to judgment, He's not going to ask you about your good intentions. He's going to want to know, did you obey me? Did you accept Jesus? Did you trust Jesus? Did you pray every time you were tempted so that you could overcome? Ladies and gentlemen, it costs a whole lot to work out our salvation. We're talking about the high cost of low living. And that cost is reflected not only upon us, but upon the Son of God. He came down from heaven. What a cost. He came down from those ivory palaces out of the perfection of his Father's house into a world of woe. What a price to pay. But as if that were not enough, he became the target of every weapon of hell. Even when he was a child, Herod tried to kill him. When he was growing up, the young people mistreated him. When they had the prom at Nazareth High School, he was left out. When they had their little private parties, he wasn't invited. Finally, he became a man, and the leaders of the churches turned against him. The priests and the Pharisees conspired to put him to death, and eventually he walked out into the Garden of Gethsemane and poured out his soul until blood ran down like sweat. What was he doing? He was paying the high cost of low living. Oh, you can't understand it. You just have to accept it. No wonder the hymnologist says, Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. And I had nothing to do with it. It was purchased at high cost by the Son of God, the gift of heaven, the darling of the Father. He paid for it with the gold of his blood and the silver of his tears. But bless God, he's worked it out so I don't have to pay. Now, it doesn't make sense to pay anyhow. For after the judgment comes payday, the Bible says the fire will rain down from heaven. Fire and brimstone. And the wicked are going to be caught up in a seething lake of fire. And the Bible says they will be destroyed, root and branch. The Bible says they shall be as ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. But I never leave people with a picture of hell. The alternative is much better. It's sweeter. And heaven starts now. Glory to God, it's the truth. Heaven starts now. And don't you want to go? If you do and you love Jesus for all he's done, and you want to ask him tonight to do something special for you, to just make you willing to do truth as you learn what truth is. That's fair enough, isn't it? As the word of God is made clear, you simply want a right spirit and an attitude of humility and obedience. And you need help to get that, for every noble impulse comes from God. If you want that help, a mind that will conform to his will, and you want him to help you, to save you, I want you to get on your feet again tonight. Every night I make an appeal, but I hope it won't become formal and trite to you. Oh, beloved, I'm sincere. I didn't come out here just to entertain you. I have come asking God daily and hourly to let me say to his people who are here what he would have me say. I've asked God to give me the courage to call sin by its right name. I've asked God to take away any spirit of compromise I don't want to be a namby-pamby, hortatory preacher just saying things to thrill you. Sometimes the things I must say will hurt you. But it will hurt you for goodness sake. And I know you need God. And I know I need Him. Like the apostle, I count not even myself to have apprehended I'm not sitting up here on our pinnacle looking down at anybody. I'm right here with you. You have to fight, I have to fight. You need my prayers, I need yours. And I ask you to pray for me. I don't want to let you down. I don't want to become a spectacle and a reproach. I need you to pray for me, and we all need Jesus. 
We don't need him now and then. We need him moment by moment in order to be kept in his love. We need him every day and every hour. And that's what you're standing about now. And on the assumption that you are sincere, I'd like to address the Father in heaven on your behalf and mine. So please bow your heads and close your eyes and shut out all human traffic. And let us pray. Mighty Father in heaven, blessed Savior Jesus Christ who loved us unspeakably, wonderful Holy Spirit who has come in amongst us tonight to impress us. The first thing we want to do is ask you to have mercy upon us according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Yes. Blood out our transgressions. Yes, Wash us of iniquity and take away our sins. And give us faith to receive it, Lord. And may we now stand before thee as thy children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, Lord. And then, Lord, your people stood in response to a specific appeal. This is what they want and it's what I want. I want to be made willing in the day of thy power. Yes. Willing to do your will, Lord. If it's not your will, let them forget it. Yes. There's too much deception in religion today. Too many extraneous weights to carry around. We want to get down to the naked truth, Lord. Yes. And then we want wills molded and bent to conform to your will. We want to please you. We want to stop playing church and get on to business. You need some holy people in Detroit, and we want to be in that number. Because you're coming for the pure in heart. Or there's some here tonight with weaknesses. Give them the assurance of strength and forgiveness. There might even be a drug addict in this audience tonight. Help them to know that you saved drug addicts. And Cliff Harris is not the only one. You're willing to save anyone that will come to you sincerely. Yes. There might be liars here, adulterers here. Help them to understand that they're going to be liars in heaven who have been saved by grace. Yes. Going to be adulterers up there who overcame. Whatever we are, Lord, we're not good enough. Cover us with the life of Jesus. Save us from what we are. Set our feet on a rock to stay. Aim our faces resolutely toward the kingdom. And help us never to look back because there's nothing down here worth giving our souls in exchange for. This world is fascinating, but it is not satisfying. Lord, we look around and we strive so hard to make it. In Detroit, help us to understand that we must look toward heaven now. Yes. The time is running out. Don't want to multiply words, Lord, but we do need you. And you're the only help we know. So have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. This is my sincere prayer. There is someone who cares when habits hold you fast. There is someone who cares on him your burdens cast. There is someone who cares. He can straighten out your past. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares when you just can't behave. There is someone who cares when sins made you a slave. There is someone who cares, and he is mighty to save. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee.
May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May you have peace in your hearts tonight and peace in your homes. Oh, blessed Lord, I've only been here three nights and already I love these people. So I beg you to print to send them home with the attendance of holy angels. I beg you, Lord, to take care of them in the cars and, and even in their houses. When to bed they creep, let angels guard their sleep. And may they have a good day tomorrow and tomorrow night. Perhaps one of the most important messages of all. He'll make your life brand new. Lord, help us to come with hope and stir up others to come out and listen to the word of the Lord. Until then, our Father, in the name of Jesus, we commend ourselves to Thee. We commit ourselves to Thee. For Jesus' sake, let everybody say Amen. Amen. You're dismissed, beloved. Please bring somebody with you tomorrow night. It's a shame not to have more people here to listen to the word of the Lord. If you agree, say amen. amen. Bring somebody. Bring a neighbor. May God go home with you is my prayer.